William. William. Bom. Gente, good, good afternoon. Uh, so, welcome to the second part. Uh, I, I promise that I'm not trying to, 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 to guide you in the, in the wall. But it's just to give some food. So, thank you so much for being here tomorrow. But, uh, this is the venue we are going to, to stay today and tomorrow. I know it's more formal, more elegant, less cozy, and Okay, we are so beginning the, 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 the second topic of this meeting, and now we're, co we're concerned with questions related to uh, state. We have the, this table now uh, that we're going to begin now, uh, composed by William Bernard, May Shuikin, Ravi Rajan, Paul Joseph, and Paul Josephson. Okay, we have half an hour for each one and after we can make a short uh, discussion about, okay? Please, uh, William Bernard, can you please begin? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I'll soften it a bit. In this paper, I want to think about a few interrelated issues concerning the environmental engagement of the Cape and South African states. It's very much a paper in formation, and I need to bump it up to the kind of level that the others who are working on the state have done. I'm going to focus on a rather specific angle, and that is the agrarian base of state environmental concerns, and especially around pastoral farming, because that's what I've essentially researched on. So this is based on past research. I also want to think about the significance of knowledge and science in the formation of state engagement. And thirdly, how we think about the state. Do we see it as essentially operating in the interests of dominant agrarian groups? Or did foresters, agricultural officers, for example, act with a degree of autonomy sometimes, sometimes act against agrarian capitalist interests? In general, I'm going to argue, as I have elsewhere, that state officials did exercise a degree of autonomy, but it's important to differentiate their approach to the largely white-owned commercial farms, large commercial farms of South Africa and the African smallholders. I want to raise a prior question, and that is, thinking comparatively, is environmental regulation a fundamental building block of the modern state? In respect of South Africa, and especially in respect of the agrarian field in South Africa, I would hesitantly argue yes. But having read the paper on China and the paper on Russia, I'm wondering whether this is generalizable. But we do need to think about the state 
an agrarian, uh, the state's environmental involvements in the agrarian field, I think in two different ways. The one is a more enabling. In other words, how are environmental problems and barriers conquered through state instruments at all the different levels? And the other is perhaps what might be the more major concern of the other papers is conservation, regulation, um, and protection. For a very rough periodization, I think it's useful to think about three different phases. Now, South Africa, colonialism began in South Africa roughly the same time as Brazil and India. Initially, maritime in the 16th, the first settlement is in the middle of the 17th century. But it only emerges as a coherent state in 1910 at Union. Prior to that, the Cape is the major colonial node. I would argue that between about 1806, when the British finally take possession of the Cape, and 1880, conquest, dispossession, control of land, imposition of private property, were the priorities of the colonial state in this sphere. And then there were also, there was a smaller British colony, Natal, a Portuguese name, interestingly enough, and two independent Boer republics, um, which competed with African, independent African kingdoms in the interior. Secondly, the foundations having been laid for a commercial capitalist agriculture I see the 1880s to the 1940s, roughly speaking, as a period when the settler agricultural economy is more securely established, and then environmental regulation and environmental enablement, you could say, become major themes, far more central concerns for the state at the local and the national level. And in this phase, Regulation often channeled environmental resources so that they were more usable, for example, water. But there was also concern about the long-term viability of settler agriculture. And in this regard, there are many echoes of the United States and Australia in the progressive era. Simultaneously, though, in the early parts of the 20th century, Preservationist concerns emerge around the rapidly disappearing wildlife and forests. And in this case, the approach is entirely different to that around regulating environmental resources. It is reservation. One could say following the American example, but in fact there had been forest reservation in the British Empire way before American wildlife or national parks were reserved. So we can see reservation as a response to a particular set of environmental protectionist problems, especially around wildlife, and especially because farmers didn't want wildlife on their land, by and large. From the Second World War, I think we can see, very roughly, a third phase. State officials become much more stridently conservationist. They're much more concerned about an ecological set of issues. In the middle phase, it was about enhancing production on the capitalist farms. In this later phase, intervention becomes tighter, both on the farms and in African peasant areas. So to summarize, I think we can see sustained attempts by the state to engage in environmental regulation at different levels in a number of spheres. It's important to differentiate South Africa from some of the other countries we're dealing with. All that light shaded space is arid and semi-arid land. Roughly 60% of South Africa is arid or semi-arid. So the environmental problems, especially in the areas I'm dealing with, that's livestock farming, are problems of aridity rather than problems of forestry and how you control the forest, eradicate the forest, protect the forest. And that's, uh, th those are the issues I want to talk about. By the time of Union in 1910, 
whites owned about 75 to 80 percent of the land in South Africa. They were about 20 percent of the population. I suspect all our countries have at certain periods in their history very unequal land ownership, and Brazil and South Africa still do have that, although South Africa is changing now to a degree. But it's important not to think of the white-owned lands as white land on every single farm in every single district in the whole of South Africa, to exaggerate slightly. There was a majority of black people on that land because black people were the tenants and the workers on the land. So I talk about white-owned farms. Settler expansion was responsible for dramatic social and economic transformations. And South Africa was one of a number of southern countries. Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, in which major livestock economies took off during the 19th century and transformed these countries completely. I think that this is a neglected and fascinating area for comparison and the scale of, the scale of livestock that was introduced into these countries was extraordinary. In South Africa, it was the only one of those countries which had indigenous livestock keeping, livestock keeping by indigenous people. But many new breeds were introduced during the colonial period. Horses, which Sandra's written about, pigs, angora goats, wool sheep, largely merino, which underpinned the Cape's major export. Ostriches, a local species, were domesticated, and of course cattle were at the heart of it all for bigger commercial farmers and also for African smallholder society. Oxen became central for transport and for draft in almost all farming in the 19th century, really up to about the Second World War. And South Africa became one of the most densely stocked Southern Hemisphere countries, peaking in 1930, roughly, at 12 million cattle and over 50 million small stock. Within the conquered zones, small towns grew up. Church, state, transport routes formed these nodes, new commercial nodes in the interior. And intensive livestock production also demand the obliteration of, li of wildlife in many of these settled areas. Antelope competed with livestock for grass. They provided free meat. And predators, once deprived of their prey, plagued livestock owners. So they also had to be eliminated. Most of the imported animals adapted to local vegetation, which is extraordinary when one considers that some of the most important areas were semi-arid. But in the case of ostriches, it was the opposite way around. Local, these were local species, ostriches, and they thrived of introduced prickly pear from Mexico, which also became an invasive plant. Almost all the labor, as I've suggested, was provided through a coerced or a partly induced from, an in, from the indigenous population. And their knowledge as workers and owners in the intensifying livestock economy was also central. Livestock management required knowledge not only about the animals, but also about the environment, about predators, plants, pastures, water resources, disease, insect, drought, and climate. So in some ways, a fundamental part of my argument in thinking about this complex is that environmental knowledge is central to the economy. And it's important, South Africa's thought of land of minerals, capitalism develops around the mines. It develops first around the intensified agrarian economy and especially the pastoral economy, although there is also a narrower, smaller wine and wheat complex and later plantations in the subtropical, on the subtropical east coast, timber plantations and sugar plantations.
And as a corollary, the livestock economy was not only the site of a waning traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge of black and white, but also new scientific knowledge. This is where many settlers and the early state essentially began to form. And fields such as botany, geology, veterinary medicines, forestry, entomology, ecology, increasingly get framed around the pastoral economy and how to improve it. Scientists assimilated farmers' knowledge, worked on farmers' knowledge, and these, the prescriptions they came up with were intensely debated. For example, in 1894, the state in the Cape intervened to make dipping of animals in chemical dips compulsory to prevent livestock diseases. It was an extraordinarily far-reaching measure. Millions and millions of animals had to be dipped on a regular basis every single month, and it was policed, sometimes even more regularly. And such interventions based on scientific understandings around scab and ticks and insects reshaped the relationship between people and the state. Scientific specialists also identified in many ways for the first time using local knowledge on occasion the environmental consequences of these massive new concentrations of livestock. From the 1850s, botanists began to spot indigenous vegetation becoming denuded. The earliest state veterinarian in 1876 was concerned because he thought the disappearance of indigenous plants was leading to livestock diseases. He had an environmental interpretation, as many in the 19th century di did, of disease. And he thought that denudation was leading directly to animal disease and was completely undermining the, in the capitalist economy, agrarian economy of the Cape. When, in 1887, the Cape first establishes an agriculture department, it essentially focuses on disease. Vi diseases in vines, diseases in livestock. And the veterinary services remain the central part of the Department of Agriculture right up to the 1930s. That's where the money gets spent, over half the annual budget. In addition to that, the state intervenes to control a whole range of other perceived pests, from locusts to jackals. And they espoused a very clear socioeconomic agenda. The old forms of livestock keeping had involved transhumans, movements of animals along uh, to water and across, across wide areas. And they also involved bringing the animals back every night to stop the predation of wild animals. The state simply wished to do away with this. They thought that this was socially backward and was unproductive. So there was a systematic attempt in trying to intervene to change the patterns of livestock keeping to fence the big farms and to fence them internally as well. So instead of moving long distances to water, pastures could be kept protected around in, in, in limited areas, they were called camps or paddocks, fenced areas. In addition to that, the first director of irrigation in 1907, who had had his experience in India, was convinced that watersheds were also being destroyed by overgrazing and by burning of vegetation. And this was diminishing the water supply. So he advocated protection of watersheds and the planting of trees. And this became significant area of state engagement as well, eventually resulting by the 1910s in public building of large dams. So all of these different elements, I think, add up to a major intervention or significant intervention. Private capital was particularly important, but the state guided and in some cases led intervention around environmental regulation. Evidence of severe soil erosion began to appear in the late 19th century. There's a strong strand in the literature on Africa as a whole that soil erosion was a figment of official imagination. 
And in some senses, it's a, it's a very typical Africanist argument, a subaltern argument, that uh, officials were looking, as it were, for routes of intervention, and that their, their identification of environmental degradation was essentially an excuse, a foil around to, to exert greater control over rural populations. I think the position is much more complex. Although there wasn't a huge amount of research done, the evidence is quite significant for extensive, extensive degradation and soil erosion. I've looked at a similar environmental scare around invasive species. The single most important invasive species was the Mexican cactus, prickly pear. It was a particularly interesting plant around which I've, I've written a book. And the reason it was so interesting was because poor people used its fruits both to eat, it was a very important food resource for poor people, but also to, to brew beer from. But it was ruinous to pedigree animals, which ate the fruits which had spikes in them and could destroy their mouths and their guts. So commercial farmers were largely pro-eradication. And in the 1930s, South Africa followed Australia with a major new scientifically-based entomolo entomological campaign getting insects from Latin America into South Africa, um, and they got rid of about 90% of the prickly pear, South Africa's first great yeah, biological campaign. By luck, more than intention, enough prickly pears survived for poor people in some areas to continue to exploit it. And you can still see a lot of it being sold on the roads during the season in a few parts of the country. And then in 1932, at the height of this period of environmental concern, initial period of environmental concern, the Union government passed a Soil Erosion Act supplemented in 1941 by a Forest and Felt Conservation Act. And this provided the state with powers to expropriate land and develop the government schemes around watersheds for erosion control, including the reservation of whole catchment areas. And in 1946, the state went further, borrowing from American legislation to create a systematic Soil Conservation Act, allowed conservation planning so the state moves in and on white-owned farms especially has subsidized water provision, mechanical works, farm planning, fencing along with other acts. Millions of pounds go in through this legislation. And a critical thing was to devolve water supplies because if you're going to have this rotated, rotated camp system so that animals didn't degrade the soil didn't degrade the pastures in any one part of farms. You had to have water. There was a huge investment in boreholes to provide water on South African farms. And the windmill becomes symbolic of the rural areas. Turning to the African areas, though, say 10 to 15 percent of the land area, depending on which period, but in respect of the population it held, 40% of the African population around the 30s and 40s, much more. In, and this was some of the best watered land. We're moving here largely to areas which are not semi-arid. In 1939 and 1949, the South Africa passed, South Africa passed betterment proclamations. This term betterment um, is quite difficult to understand. That's what it was called at the time. And what it was supposed to be was the betterment of the African areas, betterment environmentally, betterment in terms of agricultural production, and betterment socially. But here, too, the idea of rotational grazing was central. So just as on the white-owned farms, officials felt that an intensification of of pastoral farming especially was leading to environmental collapse. And in some areas it probably was. So they introduced culling, by that they meant forced sale. But the critical thing 
was to centralize village settlements. So the old settlement pattern, at least in significant parts of the country, was this very dispersed, open settlement. This is a village which escaped betterment. Some did. About 30% of the country did. And they were turned into much more concentrated villages. I don't have a good slide at the moment where the plots are adjacent to each other in lines with roads between them. And the idea was services were going to come. There would be water. There would be schools. They very seldom came. Sherman Delius argued that the critical difference between the approach on white-owned farms and African areas was that the state did intervene. The state, in a sense, saw conservation, agriculture improvement as, as central. But whereas it adopted a permissive approach on the white-owned farms, essentially inducing people through the offer of, of uh, subsidies, it was much more coercive in the African areas. By and large, I would agree with that argument, but I'd make two qualifications. Some coercive legislation also affect the white-owned farms, and by the 1980s, when we sort of move into the final stage that I talked about earlier, um, there's a much stronger legislation passed in 1983 um, where the state really does to try to control how individual white-owned farms are used. It doesn't enforce it extensively, but it's an important act. I'd also make a qualification in the African areas. Yep, I'm nearly finished. And that is that in the early phases of implementation of this Betham project, which potentially mean, meant moving almost every single peasant house in many of these, these African reserved areas, it was hugely ambitious social engineering. It wasn't collectivization. Um, they weren't trying to create villages which farmed together. They were just trying to reorganize the pattern of settlement in the African areas. Yet, in some ways, it shared ideas about collectivization, that the state was empowered and had the right, and in fact the power, to start moving people around in the rural areas, as it did in Russia and China, and of course later in other parts of Africa like Tanzania. In certain respects, I think these interventions were relatively successful. In the white-owned areas, um, part of the reason was the concentration of land holding. So if you travel through the rural parts, the drier rural parts of South Africa now, you see many disused farmhouses. Farm sizes have more than doubled in size over the last 40 years, possibly trebled in size. And the tendency has for big, bigger, wealthier farms to emerge with conservationist uh, farm owners being conservationist, as it were, they became converted to the project to some degree and saw the long-term viability of capitalist agriculture as requiring these sorts of measures. Interestingly enough, as well, there's been a major shift from livestock farming in these areas to wildlife farming. And just as South Africa has been a global leader through a kind of authoritarian conservationism in wildlife protection in national parks so that there are more wild animals in South Africa now than there have been for the last 150 years. So too it's been a global leader in the commodification of wildlife and the pri private enterprise wildlife conservation. Some of it is about hunting lions. <laughs> but a lot of it is also about just viewing. And for these reasons, in the 60%, roughly, the, the semi-arid areas, there's been an environmental recovery of kinds since the worst phase of intensified livestock production. On the East Coast, it's rather different. Massive, you can drive for miles, massive areas of sugar plantations and exotic tree plantations, eucalyptus and acacia from Australia. In the African areas, it's a more complex scenario. I think that there has been um, 
some environmental improvement, but not because of the betterment projects. The essential reason is what scholars are now calling de-agrarianization. Over the last 30 years or so, African smallholders have largely withdrawn from arable production and livestock numbers have fallen. Explaining why this should be the case amongst impoverished rural communities is complex and I can't do it here. But that, I think, has been the key to environmental stabilization. So, to conclude, the state, in certain respects, involved itself systematically in the pastoral economy over a long period of time. And I'd be interested to hear if there's any kind of parallel in Brazil or China or Russia. Um, and this might make the South African state quite distinctive. Leading intellectuals within the state and amongst farmers were highly interventionist. Um, and in some respects, I would argue, they were relatively successful, at least in terms of environmental conservation. Where I think, as we suggested before, it's important to, uh, at, in a sense, question that conclusion is that the social outcomes were very different on the white-owned farms. Now, of course, not exclusively white-owned and in the African rural areas where a much more coercive policy was developed and where the agrarian economy didn't survive state intervention. Thanks. Uh, okay, we have time for a very short and concise ob observation, comment, or question. You want anybody to? Okay, thank you, William. Uh, so we have now, uh, the, I guess, the presence of May Shuikin from Singua University. She's going to uh, present us the role of China. China's state and environmental protection. Uh, she works. Okay. Please do have a. Uh, don't make it. Are you going to, to use a. Yeah, yes. Okay, sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good afternoon. <laughs> and uh, my presentation will uh, focus on this kind of uh, topic. Actually, it's Lisa's uh, idea and structure. Okay, yeah. I just uh, follow Lisa's idea. So, And uh, before I go in detail, I will stand uh, two points. The first one is uh, my paper and the presentation, the time time uh, focus on the contemporary China Special, special. Uh, since the 1970s, that's the first one. The second one is maybe you will find there is some similarity of my presentation of paper with the government gathers, full of a uh, big talk, empty talk, but to be honest, no lies. <laughs> yeah, and. When I focus on the contemporary China since, since the 1970s, we should say it was because it was during the early years of the 1970s when both serious, serious uh, pollution, serious pollution accidents and uh, within China and uh, the increased the contact and the information from the outside world led to a gradual changes in the cons consciousness of and the policy towards the environmental issues in China. Among the pollution accidents, there are a, actually there are a lot of, I mentioned the three, three aspects. That's the pollution of the Guangxin Reservoir and the, the polluted the Dalian Bay and the Minamata disease appear in the Songhua River. Among this kind of uh, pollution accidents, the, po the pollution of the Guantin Reservoir is a, is a very important, a very key issue. Since, uh, since this reservoir is the, is the 
is the what resources, what resources uh, in Beijing. And uh, so Chinese top leadership pay special attention to the, these accidents as well as to other pollution issues. And the investigation of the Guantin Reservoir pollution was carried out by the Institute of uh, Geography. Meanwhile, increased the contact and the information from the outside, from outside the world play a big part in the rise of the China's environment protection. Among them, there are three events which reversed, diverse, uh, deserve the special mention. First, it was the USA President Nixon's inauguration speech on in January 1969 and the China's Premier Zhou Enlai response. In late January 1969, Premier Zhou read President Nixon's speech because of his speech concerning the phrase of protecting our environment. Among, his, among it, Premier Zhou made a special instruction on the bill of the CPC Council Cultural Investigation Department to select the material which related to the environmental issues from foreign countries. Premier Zhou was particularly concerned about the pollution of the de developed capitalism countries such as USA and Japan. Second one, it was the report of the Japanese journalist on pollution in Japan. In October 1970, when Premier Zhou met Japan Socialist Party delegates in Beijing. He learned about, among the delega delegation, there was a famous journalist who had been specialist in reports on pollution in Japan. Premier Zhou made a special appointment and a talk with him in order to know the pollution situation of Japan, especially the Japan's sulfur missions towards pollution in detail. He still asked him to make a report on environment pr problem next day to China's leadership and the scientists and technicians. In his report, the Japanese journalist described the serious industrial pollution in Japan, especially the Minamata disease situation. His report was issued to all staff who would attend the China's National Planning Conference next year. Thirdly, it was the United Nations Conference on Human Environment in Stockholm, 1972. It was thought that environmental management began to, to be viewed as a vital. Only one China took part in the conference and gained much experience through the participation. After the conference, there are several new phenomena which happened in China. First, the term environment protection was being spread in, into China in the session of the conference. Secondly, Chinese leadership and scientists began to break the very narrow awareness of threatening yeah, threaten the environment issues as a hygiene problem and the three industrial wastes and end them in a much broad field. Thirdly, Chinese leaders admitted, admitted that China has had a very serious environment pro, pro, uh, problem. So we think it was the interaction of about the three main affairs within China and from the outside that created the way for China states at, the very, at the various levels got involved with the environment issues and started the formulation and the implement, implementation of the Chinese environment policy. And from 1972, Chinese government stated the need to incorporate the environment in the national planning 